In this video, we're going to look at one of my favorite features of Fiddler Everywhere, which is the rules. I like the rules because I'm able to use them to simulate specific failures that would be hard to show using any other type of tool because I want to understand how my website's going to behave during certain situations. For this video, we're going to use a fictional travel web page, and it's set up like typical sites would be today. I've got the main site hosted on one specific host, but I'm pulling resources from, in my case, a simulated CDN server. I would also typically have lots of third-party resources that I would pull in from separate hosts because I want to be able to simulate failures for specific hosts and see the impact it has on my site. Here's the code for this page, and you can see that the resources, some of the images, the scripts, are being pulled from what is another host other than where the site is being hosted. So the pages for this site are pretty straightforward. They're designed using Bootstrap. And if we scroll down, we can see in this case, there's just some travel information related to Sydney. This is what we'll be using through the demos for this particular video. So I have Fiddler Everywhere open. You can see here I've got a few filters that are active. I set up some filters just to eliminate background noise from other processes running on my particular machine. So it's only going to be tracing requests to the specific pages that we're going to be looking at. On the right hand side we'll see the rules and I've got a number of rules pre-configured that we're going to use throughout this video but for this first one I want to show how you create your own rule. I'm going to start by hitting Control F5 in the browser just because I want it to force the request for all of the resources again so that I avoid my local cache and can see all of the requests in Fiddler Everywhere. Now in Fiddler Everywhere I can see the list of resources and requests that were made from the browser to the server. So I'm going to focus on the bootstrap min.css. I can simply right click and say add a new rule which we'll see was added here and automatically enabled. I'm going to double check that I have rules turned on here and I'm going to edit this rule. So we'll say make bootstrap fail and on the right hand side I can choose specific responses to come back. So I'm just going to choose here a predefined response and say I would just like to have a 404, like the CSS file was not deployed. Back in the browser, I'll hit Control F5, and we'll see what's going to happen when that particular file is actually getting a 404 response. And as you would expect, the page looks pretty terrible because the bootstrap CSS file had a 404 error, and therefore this is what uh, my users would experience. Let's take a look at how we could simulate just a specific host, in this case my CDN, being particularly slow. So I've got a pre-configured slow CDN rule here. And if we were to edit it, we can see that we're looking for the host is equal to a very specific host. So in this case, if my site has its main domain using a CDN and also a lot of third-party resources, I can focus just on one specific host. In this case, I chose the CDN. And I said, if this happens to take 25 seconds, what would that impact be for my site? With that rule enabled, we'll see that requests are being made for the CDN, but they're taking a long time. We can see the indicator to the left that shows that they are waiting for a response with the up arrow. Those will slowly start pulling in those resources. But we can see that that has a profound effect on our page. And if we were to go look in the browser, we can see again the user experience would be a completely blank page while it's waiting for these resources to be downloaded from the CDN. For the next rule, rather than focus on a specific host that is failing, we're just going to make all third-party hosts be intentionally slow. So if we take a look at that rule, 
we'll see the difference on the left hand side where the host is not equal to the primary domain. So I like to use this because we use third party services often on our websites. This will give me a quick indicator for if anybody is particularly slow, will that have an impact on my site? Have I coded around that? Or will that specific delay make my users wait? It turns out for my particular page, I'm not using additional third party hosts, but the idea with that rule is I can target anyone other than my primary domain. So again, the experience from a user's perspective is they're looking at a completely blank page, which again is a horrible experience. For the next rule, we're going to see how we can actually set conditionals and have multiple aspects of the rule apply. So we're gonna look at how to slow down the CDN, but only for JPEG images. So if we take a look at what that rule looks like, this is the first time we'll have multiple conditions where we're looking specifically for if the host is the CDN, but also is it a JPEG, then we want to delay the request. So let's see what this looks like in the browser. So here what you'll see is there's space underneath London, England, but if I were to look at Stockholm, in Sydney, there's not space allocated. So here we don't have shift. Here we're gonna have what's called cumulative layout shift, which is bad for the core web vitals measurement. So by not pre-allocating space for the intended image size, that delay caused things to shift. So this will be the first time we'll also look at how we can code around this. So here in Visual Studio Code, we can see that with London, England, the image, we've specified both a width and a height. We notice on the other ones for Stockholm and also for Sydney that we have neglected to specify the height. Without the height, the image width and height, the browser does not know how much space it needs to allocate. You can also use, there's a new property in CSS called aspect ratio, which will do the same thing. But it shows how using that coding technique is important to give a good experience and how using Fiddler's rules shows you that that's a specific problem that could occur. It would be very difficult to test and have it randomly be that one of those images were slow enough to notice. That's why rules are so powerful. Another rule is the ability to just slow CSS and see the impact on user experience. So if we look at the rule for this, it's simply looking for URLs that end with .css. Let's look at what the impact would be on a browser. So as you would expect, CSS is a blocking resource, which means while it's waiting to be downloaded, the page won't continue to render. So unfortunately, the users are looking at a completely blank page. Let's take a look at a technique we could use that will fix this. The coding technique we're going to look at is called inlining critical CSS. So in this case, I found a tool that would split my CSS file specifically for Bootstrap into two separate parts. The first part is what it, the tool considered critical to show the main portion of the viewport. The rest of it, it split off and said is used elsewhere for not important things for the initial rendering. So the first thing I needed to do was comment out my original access to CSS files. I then inline the critical, which just means I directly place the minified styles into the HTML file. Now, as soon as the browser has the HTML, it has the critical styles it needs to be able to show the page. Then if we scroll down, we'll see the other CSS files, the non-critical, are now being pulled in using what's called a media print. And what that does is it deprioritizes those requests and indicates to the browser they're not required for the initial rendering. So they will be downloaded, um, but they won't cause us to wait. So let's see what the browser experience would look like in this example. So here we can see that even though the browser is spinning and waiting for other resources, the other things that are happening on the page, we can see that the page does show its initial paint right away. Of course, there's trade-offs with this. The file will become larger. There's some caching trade-offs. But if you test this and find that this is a better user experience for you, it's just a good example of taking advantage of the rules to make something specifically slow, test the impact, decide how you want to code and what sort of experience you want to have, and then be able to show what that will end up looking like in the particular browser. 
The next web development technique we'll look at is using what's called custom web fonts. So this has been a great addition where you can actually download specific fonts you want to use for your page. We want to see how different browsers behave and then see that there's now some options to control how browsers will choose to render from a performance standpoint. So if we look at the slow lobster, so lobster is the name of the Google font here that I'm using that I have hosted. So it's looking for that specific web font file and delaying that request. So I'm using the new Edge browser and you'll see it uses flash of unstyled text, which means by default it's showing a fallback font until the web font's actually downloaded and then it switches that font. This can lead to cumulative layout shift again, where if the fonts are very different from each other, the page will have to re-render and relay things out and cause a shift. But it can also be disconcerting for the user to see one particular font first and then have it switch midstream. There's a new ability to actually control this that was added to CSS, so you can choose between what they call uh, flash of invisible text or flash of unstyled text. So let's take a look what that would look like. So here's a typical way that web fonts are used in a page where you can see that we're referencing the Lobster 2 font and that is the default and then it's left up to the browser to decide how it's going to choose to render whether it will show a system font or a fallback font while it waits or whether it will keep it completely invisible and only show the new font. The new CSS property that lets us control this is called font display. From a performance perspective, one of the options is called optional. And what that tells the browser is, if you can get this font very quickly, then display it with using the custom font. If you can't, then automatically assume you'll use the fallback font for the entire first request and don't shift it in between. So in other words, if it's not immediately available, then use the fallback font for this entire page and don't change it. So it will be visible quickly, but it won't be the font that's originally desired. Now what will happen is as they go through the rest of the site to other pages, it will use the custom font that's cached. So it gives the benefit from a performance perspective of rendering very quickly. And if your fallback font is close to your next font, most people won't notice that on the first page they saw a fallback font and the rest of their experience they're seeing the custom font that you desired. So let's see how this looks in a browser. So here we'll see with font optional that it shows the fallback font for the entire experience. So it's not going to shift during my first page view. If I were to hit refresh in the browser, however, simulating looking at another page on the same site, you'll see that it's using the custom font. Because it was cached, the first page shows the fallback, and then the remaining pages will show the custom font. And it's just a trade-off from a performance perspective that if that font happened to download slow on the first request, we don't want the user waiting to get the page to render. So we've made that trade-off by using the font display and optional. So let's take a look in this example. I'm also using the jQuery library. And by default, it gets pulled from the CDN like you would expect. We do have a rule here, though, that can make that particular download fail. So in this case, if you're looking for the specific jQuery file, it's going to return a 404. So let's look at how the site would behave in this case if we take advantage of something that we call CDN fallback. So knowing that it might be possible for that file to fail, we've actually coded around it to see if we don't see jQuery defined by pulling it from the CDN, we'll instead fall back and use a local copy of the script from our own server. So we don't get some of the performance advantages of pulling it from a CDN, but the site will still behave as you would expect. So let's look at what that looks like. So you can see from a user's experience, the site behaved exactly like we would expect, even with that rule in place. But if we were to take a look at what we see in Fiddler Everywhere, we'll actually see a couple interesting things. The first is that the jQuery file originally actually fails from the CDN, as you would expect. And it actually does a fallback to pull that file locally from the actual website rather than the CDN. So the user experience is, it looks visually the same, 
it probably took a little longer because instead of pulling that jQuery file from the CDN, it had to go back to my original host. But the experience still was okay. Uh, it painted fine, so it's a good way to tolerate failure of a CDN downloading a JavaScript file. Let's take a look at what the code would look like. So we can see here the original link to pull the jQuery from the CDN. That happens to be a blocking request. So by the time that's finished, the next script block says if jQuery is now not defined, rewrite a local script tag that pulls it from this server rather than the CDN. It's another trade-off we can make for pulling jQuery from a CDN if the CDN were to happen to fail. And again, a good example of how Fiddler Everywhere rule system allows us to test very specific failures like this and know that we have a way to tolerate them properly. Let's take a look at another typical example. So I do work with a lot of vendors that want me to host JavaScript files within my site for very specific purposes. And typically, they will say they want to be first. So in other words, their script is the most important thing on my web page. So they want me to add it to the head section of my page and have it be the very first thing that I'm going to reference. Let's take a look at what that might do if that particular vendor is slow. So in Fiddler Everywhere, we have a rule for a slow vendor. If I were to roll over here, just every vendor wants to be first.js, and I'm slowing it by 25 seconds. So typically, when I tell them I'm concerned about this for performance, they'll say this shouldn't have any impact on your site from a performance perspective. So let's see what happens. As you would suspect, it's not a true statement. By being first in the head section with a script, scripts are a blocking resource by default. So they're actually going to now make me wait until their script is downloaded and executed. So if they happen to be slow on a given day, they're impacting the user experience for my entire site. So let's take a look at what we can do to help solve this problem. There are several ways to avoid this particular problem. Recently, browsers have added the ability to use either an async attribute or a defer attribute. The async says, please download me in the background, don't block rendering, as soon as I'm done downloading, execute. The defer says, don't block rendering, uh, please wait a bit longer and keep the source order of my scripts uh, in the proper order. So if there are dependencies between them, they'll be run in the correct order. So they'll be downloaded first, but then queued up and executed in order. I prefer defer in this situation just because it's moving the impact of this further down in the page life cycle. And again, by saying defer, I'm acknowledging this is not required for the main paint, but it makes it where now I'm not going to be impacted if that is slow. So let's take a look at what that looks like in the browser with the rule still in place. If we take a look what this looks like in the browser, we can see that it paints immediately now because it's not waiting, but you can see that the browser is still spinning waiting for that JavaScript file that we have now deferred. So it will eventually finish and execute, but it no longer affects our rendering. So that wraps up this video, and it just shows the power of Fiddler Everywhere and its rule system, and the ability to very selectively make specific resources slow or fail in ways that we can then test and see how our site will behave and possibly use different coding techniques. In the next video, we're going to focus on two main features in Fiddler Everywhere, the composer and the rules. And we're going to see how with composer, we can manually construct requests or make slight modifications to existing requests and see how our server will behave. We can also use rules to adjust content as it's sent from the browser to the server. We're also going to look at how we can do from the server back to the browser using rules and how we can take advantage of that to have local files replace files that otherwise would have come from the web server or CDN or somewhere else. It allows us to quickly check out changes we want to make to the site without having to actually deploy it in that specific system.